Hey guys, welcome to another analysis video of Cassandra Clare's Chain of Gold. If you're new to this channel, hey, welcome. Where the hell have you been all this time? And if you've been here before, hey, welcome back. It's so nice to have you back again. So, some of the last few chapters of Chain of Gold, let's do it. If you've been watching this series, you will be sick to death of this disclaimer. However, I do just want to do it. I don't want to spoil Chain of Gold. It's such a good book. So please, if you haven't read it, do tread carefully in this video. This video will contain tons of spoilers. So if you haven't read Chain of Gold, please go and come back and it will all make so much more sense. As we all know by now, this video is more going to be about like the references to the other books in the Shadowhunter Chronicles and any other like tiny tidbits that I think could be interesting in these chapters of Chain of Gold. So so if that's what you want, please do stay. And if that's what you don't want, please stay anyway. It means a lot that you guys are watching these videos. So should we begin? Right, chapter 20, and we are back into the action at the graveyard with Matthew Cordelia and James in the other dimension. The first thing I want to pick up on is the tiny little like excerpt to Paradise Lost that Cassie has included at the start of this chapter. So as you know, Paradise Lost is a super famous poem by none other than John Milton. And I won't lie, I haven't actually read it. It is super long. Anyway, in this excerpt that Cassie includes at the start of this chapter, it actually mentions Belial himself. So Cassie does this a lot, especially in the Infernal Devices series and the Dark Artifices series. She puts like these tiny snippets from literature at the start of her chapters. And I don't know why, but I just think this is like a really nice use of this poem. So after the rope that is tethering James to Matthew and Cordelia and the other dimension slackens, Cordelia gets Cortana, holds it forwards and breaks the archway between dimensions, going in after Cortana and following James to this new realm. On her way, it's described how she sees shards of glass, each containing an image, a beach, and a bleeding moon, an underground cave, a citadel on a hill, a demon rising up before a watchtower. Okay, so two theories here. Either these images of these scenarios are gonna be super, super important in Chain of Iron or Chain of Thorns, or Cassie is cleverly mentioning the other books in her Shadowhunter series. A beach and a bleeding moon? Is this not the Dark Artifices with Emma and Julian on that steamy, steamy beach scene? An underground cave? Will and Tessa in the Infernal Devices, right? A citadel on a hill. Isn't that what happens with Sebastian and the Endarkened Warriors in the Mortal Instruments series? And a demon rising up before a watchtower. That one, I'm not too certain about, but I'm sure it's happened in one of the books before. And if it hasn't, I am 99% sure this will happen in the Wicked Powers. Taking a step away from the graveyard scene, and Thomas is rushing to the console's house to try and make the antidote potion, and he runs into the house and finds none other than Charles and Alistair. So the quote I wanna pick up on is the fact that Cassie writes how Thomas saw the way Alistair looked at Charles and felt a dull pain. So my question for you is do you think Thomas is aware of his feelings for Alistair? I'm not sure how you guys feel but at the start of the novel I kind of thought he was a bit oblivious of the way he felt about Alistair Carstairs and I don't know if this is like a transition into him actually realising his feelings for him. If anything this just makes it a whole lot sadder. I am not ready for their relationship in Chain of Iron. And also when Cassie released this piece of information about her cat Reginald crying over Thomas and Alistair's relationship in her Chain of Iron preview. My heart cannot take what is going to happen to Tom Stair in the next few books. So Cordelia successfully breaks through the archway using Cortana and she finds James on the other side and James sees Cordelia and comments on her hands that were bloody from tearing at vines. Surely this is an allusion to Queen of Air and Darkness from the Dark Artifices series when Emma and Julian are trying to get into the Unseely Court and there's that whole scene with Emma trying to battle through the vines and in the end they get through but she's like covered with scratches from thorns and like everything's bloody. I'm just saying, is this not the same thing but with a different cast as many generations later? Again, I would give my soul if Emma and Cordelia could meet. Can you just imagine that? It would just be, oh, amazing. James and Cordelia then come back into the normal world and James is near the brink of death, which causes Jesse to actually offer James his last breath. I don't really have anything to say here apart from, oh my God, Jesse. That is literally all I annotated at this point. It's not a reference to another book or anything important for Chain of Iron. It's just some Jesse Blackthorn appreciation. I feel like Jesse doesn't get the rep he deserves. And I just want to start the ball rolling at the Jesse Blackthorn Appreciation Club. This next point I definitely mentioned before. It's another Bodica reference, this time by James Herondale, when him and Cordelia are talking about her nickname perhaps being too soft for her because she's such a badass warrior that's just saved his life. So he says to Cordelia, we should have given you a more warrior-like nickname, not Daisy, but Artemis. 
Christmas or Boudicca. Again, a nice like father-son parallel, Will telling Tessa that she should be strong like Boudicca, and then James telling his love interest that she is like Boudicca. It's just another nice Wessa and Jordelia reference, and by now I'm convinced that she's trying to parallel these two relationships. This point links nicely to my next one, when James asks Cordelia if they can read together, and Cordelia goes, reading together, never had Cordelia heard of anything so romantic. Again, reading together is such a Will and Tessa thing. It's just like parallel crazy in this chapter for me. So after a while, the adults finally come, and it feels really weird calling Will and Tessa the adults, but in this book, they are the parental figures. And Cassie describes how Cordelia recognizes Will Herondale, his torch casting bright illumination over his black and silver hair, and Tessa, a sword in her hand. So two things stand out here for me. One of them is a bit more trivial than the other. If you've guys seen my Infernal Devices fan casting, you'll know that me and my friend really like Aaron Taylor Johnson as young Will. However, when it comes to old Will, my favourite is none other than Henry Cavill, specifically in the new Netflix film Enola Holmes. Do not tell me this man is not Will in Chain of Gold. He looks just like him. So yeah, when I read this sentence, I was like, oh, I can really imagine what Will looks like a bit older now. It's really nice to imagine these characters grown up now. The point about Tessa is that she's now carrying a sword. Just some like nice development from how on the Infernal Devices she had that thing where she was like at the start women shouldn't really be warriors and she sort of judged Charlotte a bit because Charlotte always used to carry weapons and then as we went through the Infernal Devices series she started to be able to defend herself and grew a lot more stronger and I feel like it just reached a nice peak in Chain of Gold where she can obviously easily defend herself and now she looks like a true shadow hunter carrying a weapon to like a fight or a situation where she needs to potentially defend herself. Another thing I want to quickly mention about Tessa is that for me she has like two distinct periods in her life. I feel like in the Infernal Devices she was struggling with like who she was both in like what she stood for but also when she found out that she was like half warlock half shadow hunter but now in Chain of Gold I feel like she sort of chooses the shadow hunter life over the warlock side if that makes sense. Like she's living in the institute, she's married to Will, she's grown up around shadow hunters now. I feel like at this point she's more shadow hunter than warlock if that makes sense. And then for me I think when Will dies she sort of leans into her warlock heritage a bit more at that point. She focuses on her warlock powers and she perfects them and fine tunes them. She even studies at the Adamant Citadel at some point until modern day Tessa, sort of like TDA and post TDA and Ghost of the Shadow Market, has fully grasped her warlock powers and along with the rest of the immortal gang is a super super powerful warlock. Let me know what you guys think about this but for me I do think Tessa has like the shadow hunter years and the warlock years after. This isn't a negative thing, in fact I find it kind of cool and essentially she's now an even cooler half shadow hunter half warlock which in my book is pretty damn cool. After chapter 20 there is a short flashback chapter when Alistair comes home from the academy and Cordelia notes how he's so different how he's changed so much. Cordelia notices how he's really moody he's gone in on himself and he keeps going for like solo isolated walks so she really wants to know what's going on and she pokes and pokes at him until he finally breaks and he says how many people came here this year to mock you? How many asked what was wrong with you that you didn't have a private tutor? or suggested your family was some kind of near do wells because we moved around a lot. Essentially, Alistair got heavily bullied at Shadowhunter Academy. He then mentions that he had two choices to either be bullied or be the bully, and obviously he chose to be the bully, which then leads into the reasons why the Merry Thieves actually hate Alistair Carstairs so much. But the point I want to make here is, do you guys think Alistair will redeem himself in Chain of Iron and Chain of Thorns? Honestly, I have such high hopes for Alistair Carstairs. I really hope he turns it around. But I'm just intrigued to see how and and why if he'll ever issue an apology to the Merry Thieves, especially to Matthew, and just what's gonna happen to Alistair Carstairs now. Chapter 21 and James is recovering from his injuries in the Institute. Obviously he's been visited by every single one of the Merry Thieves. Matthew makes a really funny comment about the fact that James is now the hero of the clave and he can like make any demands that he wants and if Matthew was the hero of the clave he would demand that Oscar Wilde be brought to him to have conversation. James then goes isn't he dead to which Matthew goes nothing wrong with the the undead. Right, you guys know that I think something bad is going to happen to Matthew Fairchild in the next two books. Personally, my favourite theory is that he's going to become a downworlder. So my first thought was perhaps werewolf, but after this line, I'm leaning more towards a vampire. Obviously, this line could be alluding to the fact that Matthew has like slept with a vampire before, or it could be foreshadowing that he doesn't actually mind vampires and he will actually become one. I don't know why, but I just don't think Matthew Fairchild is going to 
come out of the last hour series completely unharmed. Back to James now and he's describing how his parents reacted when he described to them just what exactly went down in that different dimension. He mentions Tessa's reaction as like super practical, how she's not surprised and how she had also been trying to find out who her father was. But Will on the other hand, I think this is one of my favourite quotes from the whole entire book. Will had been angry at the world and then gone to see Jem. If this doesn't sum up Will and Jem's new relationship as Jem's a silent brother and Will steals a shadow hunter then I don't know what does. Enter Grace Blackthorn and they're talking about just how mad Tatiana really is. Grace describes how Tatiana dedicated herself to bringing Jesse back to life, collecting books of necromancy and scoring shadow markets for Hands of Glory. Do you know who else was trying to find Hands of Glory to also bring back someone from the dead? It was Malcolm Fade. This illusion hurts my heart. I don't want to be reminded of what went down with Malcolm Fade and Annabelle Blackthorn. I saw the words Hands of Glory. I got that Lady Midnight reference, hit me like a ton of bricks. And I was just like, I can't, I need to move on. James then tells Grace that they need to relay this information to his parents and Grace panics because she thinks not only will the consequences affect Tatiana, they will also affect her as well. She also then starts to say Jessie's name and then stops, breaks off mid-sentence and her hands start to flutter like panicked moths. If you guys have seen the amazing Chain of Iron artwork with Lucy on the front, you'll know that she's surrounded by moths. So moths actually symbolise death and that's the reason why Lucy is surrounded by them on Chain of Iron because she can control the dead or she's got some powers involving the dead that we will find out a bit more about in the next book. But for me, the fact that Cassie describes Grace's hands fluttering like moths when she mentions Jessie, it's just like a really cool description. And it's one of those situations when the readers actually know more than the characters. It's super subtle, but in my opinion, it's such a nice way to do it. Grace then goes to put the possessing silver bangle back on James. And she's like super apologetic when she's doing it. She's like, oh, I really, really don't want to do this, but like, I kind of have to. My mother made me her blade. So I've mentioned in previous videos my theory that I think Grace is actually a trained shadow hunter and she's pretending to be weak, as evidenced in the Bane Chronicle story The Midnight Air. This quote about the blade then is actually a direct allusion to this story, in particular the quote that Grace says to Magnus, I am my mother's blade. Again, it's just like a nice reference to an outsider Shadow Hunter Chronicles book and it just makes the collection feel so much more like personal and smaller and more intertwined which is something that's really hard for authors to do, especially when they have so many books, but which I think Cassie does really well. And to be honest, is the whole premise of this series on my YouTube channel. So whilst James is getting repossessed by Grace, Lucy actually travels to Idris with Jem. And she unnecessarily comments, was it strange for Will, she wondered, to be aging and have Jem remain in appearance still a boy? Lucy, no one asked for this dagger in the heart. Why would you say this? I was just enjoying like a cute, uncle niece moment between Lucy and Jem and then she's just like do you ever think about how Will will die but Jem and Tessa will live on forever? It's just not necessary is it Lucy? A perhaps more positive and slightly more hopeful interaction between Jem and Lucy is when he tells Lucy that her name actually means light which is fair enough it does mean light but it's also the main character from A Tale of Two Cities Will and Tessa's favourite book and we all know they named her after this because they are massive book nerds. So Jem um, Lucy may mean light, but you surely can't believe that's the reason why Will and Tessa named her that. So looking forward to Chain of Iron, and one of the things that I'm really excited about is that it's going to be set in the winter. So Lucy mentions that the demon towers were turning the colour of a tree in autumn. Cassie has confirmed that Chain of Iron will be taking place in the winter months, and I don't know why I'm so excited for this. I feel like the majority of her books normally start in like spring slash summer. If you know of any of them that are actually set in the winter, please leave a comment below because I genuinely can't think of any. I feel like it would just be like a nice seasonal change to the Shadowhunter series. And I don't know why, but the thought of Shadowhunters in snow just makes me so happy. Back to the Institute now and the absolute mess that is Grace and James. Grace goes to kiss James and he immediately thinks of Cordelia, which I'm sorry is like the biggest red flag ever. I don't know how he doesn't know he's in love with this girl. To top it off, he even tells himself that he and Cordelia had been performing for the sake of strangers when they were caught in the whispering room getting to together and honestly I wanted just to hit myself with this Kindle repeatedly. If James carries on this blind I just I don't think I can do it. Tessa really needs to hit him with a water jug like she did with Will at the start of Clockwork Angel to knock some sense into her son. Cordelia then actually turns up at the institute carrying 
a book to read to James and she's so excited. She's so buzzing to see him. And she goes to walk into his room and Grace Blackthorn leaves with him. And I'm just like, oh. So he's trying to defend his sudden change of heart. And he goes, she's made me understand that everything she has done, she's done because she loves me. Now I must do something for her. And Cordelia actually makes the illusion for us. And she says, in the back of her head, Cordelia heard Alistair's voice. Everything he does is so he and I can be together. Obviously, Alistair says this when she catches him with Charles. And then Charles gets engaged to Ariadne and it's like a whole mess. And she's like, why would you do this? And he's like, oh, he's got engaged to Ariadne so him and I can be together. I really love that Cordelia's made this illusion for us because it shows that Grace and Charles are just both schemers. And to be honest, they deserve to end up together. As you can tell, I'm not happy that James and Cordelia still aren't together. Then one of my favorite bits of this book happens and James burns down Blackthorn Manor. He's burning down the house, isn't he? Said Cordelia. So the link I want to bring in here is in the Dark Artifices series, particularly Lord of the Shadows, when Julian actually thinks of burning down the then rebuilt Blackthorn Manor as a way to lure Annabelle Blackthorn out of it. And there's this really funny one-liner in this book when Magnus goes, you're actually not the first person that's thought about doing that. Obviously, Chain of Gold came out after Queen of Air and Darkness, but I love that there's now this like backstory to that comment by Magnus in TDA. This point then leads in nicely to Lucy saying that she was really upset that they burnt down the manor without her because she's always wanted to burn down a house. If you believe the theory that Jesse will be resurrected and him and Lucy will actually get together and their ancestry line will produce the modern day Blackthorns, you will realise that Lucy will be happy to know that her ancestors are equally as pyromaniacs as she is as well. There's a nice reference to Great Expectations, which is the novel Chain of Gold is loosely based off, when Lucy mentions how in Blackthorn Manor, all the rooms were full of dry rotten black beetles and the clocks all stopped at 20 to 9. If you've read Great Expectations, you will remember that Miss Havisham actually stops all the clocks in her house, so she isn't aware of time passing. You'll also know that Tatiana is loosely based on Miss Havisham. So yeah, this reference is one for those literary nerds out there, and I really appreciate Cassie just dropping this in. The final thing I want to talk about in today's video is a tiny reference to the name of the next book, Chain of Iron. So obviously Cordelia is super heartbroken that James and Grace are back together, but when herself, the Merry Thieves, and Lucy all cheers to them being heroes, she mentions how the iron band around her heart loosened just a little. So when I read this, I obviously knew this was a reference to Chain of Iron, and I feel like it's a nice, like, subtle reference to the next book in the Last Hour series, but it doesn't give too much away, and it's not too overboard. So yeah, I feel like it's like a breadcrumb trail that Cassie is starting, preparing us mentally for the next book. Not that we can ever really be mentally prepared for it, let's be honest. Okay, that's it for today's video. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please give it a like if you've enjoyed it, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. Equally, if you know anyone that has read Chain of Gold, is reading Chain of Gold, or is even rereading Chain of Gold, please, please share my videos with them. I would love to see what they think about all these references that I've picked out on, and I would love to know if they found anything else similar as well. Next time will actually be the final analysis video. I'm going to do chapters 22, 23, and the epilogue. So hopefully it's going to be like a huge finale to this series. So stay tuned for that one, and I shall see you guys next time.